There are various ideas as to what ghosts and hauntings actually are, and while no one can be certain, there are some very compelling ideas. In this video we'll talk about what ghosts could actually be, the different types of hauntings and some of the different investigation methods to try out while you're out ghost hunting. I'm Mike, and if you've got your K2 at the ready, let's go find some ghosts. Chapter 1. What are ghosts? So, what are ghosts? Well, they're the spirits of dead humans, I hear you say. And while this is the most widely accepted concept, that doesn't necessarily rule out some of the other ideas. The concept of human spirits is that every human has a soul or consciousness, as I like to think of it, that is able to live on in some capacity after the death of the physical body. This quite possibly could be in some form of spirit realm, which humans generally can't interact with. I personally like to think of this as our consciousness not necessarily existing within our physical bodies, but rather being beamed into us from an unseen place or realm. And when our physical bodies cease to exist, our consciousness joins some sort of greater intelligence or god. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Which can interact with our physical world when summoned by one of the previously mentioned methods. Are you still here? Hopefully that wasn't too out there. As stated before, ghosts being the souls of dead humans is just one idea. Another popular concept is that ghost hunters are actually interacting with other humans in a parallel dimension, and the theory goes that in certain haunted hotspots, they could actually be areas of the Earth where our veil is thinner to the next world or parallel universe. But what if the next world isn't actually an afterlife, as a lot of people seem to think, but is actually an alternate version of our own universe? and the spirits that we are communicating with are actually just other humans that can somehow affect our reality with things like knocks and bangs, moving objects and disembodied voices. There could be an infinite number of parallel universes, which means that the possibilities for hauntings could be entirely endless. But in saying that, perhaps there are certain areas of the world where the circumstances are just right to communicate with one or multiple of these other realities. There is a hypothesis or thought that some of these realities could be either in the past or in the future compared to our own reality. But this leads me to wonder, if some of these realities are in the future, why is it we never encounter ghosts from the future? Or does that say more about the way we investigate how we're always so focused on the past? The final theory to cover and my personal favourite is that ghosts are entities that exist in a higher dimension to our own. This starts to get into the realm of quantum physics and the anomalies experienced within quantum physics to start to try and explain some of the supernatural or paranormal goings on that people experience. So strap in and bear with me on this because this could get a little bit heavy and a bit sciencey. If an entity existed in the fourth dimension, which is the dimension above what we live in, it wouldn't necessarily be bound to our laws of time and space. As a hypothesis, this means that objects being apported or teleported in the third dimension could be the entity within the fourth dimension reaching into ours, pulling out an object into its own dimension, which would give the impression of the object disappearing in the blink of an eye, and then placing it somewhere else in our dimension. Again, if entities in other dimensions aren't bound to our laws of time and space, this could happen instantaneously. Again, this is entirely hypothetical, but while quantum physicists have been trying to test theories, they've actually discovered things such as quantum entanglement that doesn't make sense in the capacity of previously understood physics theorem. Quantum entanglement is essentially where you have two very small atoms or particles that could be in two totally different places, but as you affect one of them, the second particle will actually react as if it is being affected in the same way, despite the fact that they aren't seemingly linked in any way at all. Personally, I like this idea as it makes sense in my previously mentioned cloud of consciousness idea. If human consciousness exists in a higher dimension after our physical bodies pass, this could explain how ghosts are able to interact with us but we can't necessarily interact with them. This could also cover the idea of higher vibrational beings and the realm of vibration that they exist in. Does that sound a little bit like dimensions to you, as in we're in the third dimension and then there's multiple dimensions above us? This hypothesis also covers that these higher dimensional beings may not have ever been human or are the spirits of dead humans and could rather be a entity of their own altogether. Let me finish this chapter by saying that I am in no way a scientist and that my interpretation of a couple of these ideas could be very, very off from the realities of how quantum physics works. 
but in saying that whatever you believe ghosts are or the afterlife is that's correct and the reason that's correct is that no one knows for certain and almost everything in the paranormal is entirely based on belief chapter two types of hauntings now that we've covered some of the ideas of what ghosts could be let's talk about the various different types of hauntings there are two main types of hauntings that are generally spoken about and these are known as residual or intelligent hauntings starting with residual hauntings the idea is that in areas where something highly emotional or traumatic has happened the earth land or possibly even the building has somehow been imprinted or scarred with this traumatic or highly emotional act and this high emotional trauma could be related to something such as extreme sadness an unfortunate and sudden death a violent act or a despicable crime and due to this it is believed that the land or building or earth acts as a sort of recording device capturing those high emotions and replaying them possibly at specific times like the anniversary of the act or maybe sometimes more frequently again it's entirely hypothetical no one really understands if there is any rhyme or reason to it this is often described as the stone tape theory which is the speculation that ghosts and hauntings are analogous to tape recordings and it states that mental impressions during emotional or traumatic events can be projected in the form of energy recorded onto rocks and other items and then replayed under certain conditions these are known as residual hauntings where these are believed to be recordings of past events and it's said that the spirits within them can't be interacted with and are doing whatever they were at the time of the traumatic experience this is often the explanation for why ghosts are seen wearing old-timey clothing speaking in an older language or being able to walk through walls and levitate and the idea around being able to walk through walls and levitate is at the time that these people existed those walls or floors may not have so they are just reenacting the floors that they would have walked on or walking through a area where there wasn't a wall Moving on to intelligent hauntings, these are, well, exactly as they sound. I am too smart! I am too smart! Ghosts or spirits that can intelligently interact with those investigating and respond to questions or directly interact with equipment. Intelligent hauntings seem to be the rarer of the two and in my experience are the more interesting as this tends to open up more questions as to what the ghosts or spirits actually are. I've had some incredible experiences from what we believe to be intelligent spirits, from knocks and bangs on command, to a K2 meter seemingly answering intelligently to our questions, to our Alice box offering some extremely relevant words out of a bank of around 2,000 words. And while I appreciate that all of these gadgets are experimental and unproven, I like to think about this in the terms of how improbable those moments are. It's not possible. Not probable. And when some of those moments become too coincidental or too much of a synchronicity that they could actually be considered paranormal this isn't to say that hauntings couldn't be something else entirely such as a focus of multiple people's consciousness causing activity to manifest as i say the residual and intelligent hauntings are generally the most widely accepted ones but no one knows for certain we still don't understand the full capabilities of the human brain and studies from the CIA have found that almost every human being has some sort of latent level of psychic ability. And this leads me into the final type of haunting I'll cover and that's poltergeists and if you haven't noticed by now I bloody love a poltergeist story. While poltergeists could certainly be considered a form of intelligent haunting they seem to be able to ramp this up to 11. These go to 11. Poltergeists seem to hold a very particular skill set which would have certainly won them some sort of school talent show if that sort of thing exists in their dimension. From apporting or levitating objects to being able to conjure phantom sounds from thin air, create spontaneous water puddles that can't be removed or starting fires from nothing, poltergeists really have all the tricks to strike fear on those most unfortunate to be haunted by them. And when I say those unfortunate enough, I truly mean this. From my time researching the paranormal, it would seem that poltergeists tend to haunt people rather than places. And this is evidenced by the countless amount of stories of poltergeist activity actually following people to their workplace. The target of poltergeists generally seem to be teenage girls starting or going through puberty. And while this isn't always the case, stories not involving a teenage girl are certainly the outlier. 
There are many ideas as to what poltergeists actually are, from interdimensional beings able to manipulate our reality in ways that are much greater than our own, to manifestations of extreme emotional stress and trauma, or even the interdimensional being theory is evidenced in their ability to levitate objects. Scientists have actually been able to levitate water droplets at different heights using certain sound waves, however this always seems to end with too much pressure building up and the water droplets exploding. What if a poltergeist has a much better grasp on this ability beyond our own and could levitate things like houseplants and other objects using this method of sound manipulation but also has the ability for it to not build too much pressure or explode whatever the object is? All in all, once again, everything in this chapter is entirely hypothetical and is down to interpretation and belief. And because of that, it is up to you to make your own decisions on what you believe and what type of haunting you are dealing with while investigating. Chapter 3. Investigation Methods Now that we've spoken about what ghosts and hauntings could be, let's discuss investigation techniques. Again, everything I'm about to say are just ideas and there is no right or wrong way to investigate. One of the issues, however, with ghost hunters is that we seem to have developed our own language that can be quite difficult for those outside of the ghost hunting circle to understand at first. With talks of K2s, Estes methods and portals, it can be very confusing for someone who is just entering this world. I'll start with the basics. Calling out is the name given to the act of directly trying to communicate with spirits. This will often end up with you talking to thin air in some cold, dingy basement at 3am in the morning, but that's just something that has to be done to try and experience true paranormal activity. Beyond calling out, which is the foundation of all investigating, there are practical methods such as table tipping and Ouija boards, and gadgets such as EMF detectors, and a whole range of sensors to detect changes in the environment such as temperature or air pressure. I'm personally not a fan of the practical methods as I feel they can be easily manipulated by the people using them subconsciously and because of that I prefer the gadget side of things. An instrument that would not only supply inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal grammeters. I also believe that a gadget giving a reading in isolation is not necessarily paranormal and that these gadgets should be used to reinforce other goings-on rather than relying entirely on a device giving evidence as people call it. Moving on to other investigation methods, the Estes method is a term that is banded around by a lot of paranormal teams but often not actually explained. This method is set up with one person known as the vessel being blindfolded and then listening to a spirit box. A spirit box is essentially a broken radio that rapidly scans the radio stations with a hope that you'll be able to hear something through the static. The spirit box is listened to through headphones for the Estes method and is thought to be some sort of sensory deprivation with the blindfold as well. At this point, the other investigators will ask questions in a hope that the vessel will respond and respond with relevant terms. The vessel can't actually hear the questions being asked, which adds a little bit more weight to this, and this can be adapted by having two vessels at once, so two people listening to spirit boxes and both being blindfolded, or having the vessel in another part of the building entirely and using a mobile phone so that the team members can hear the responses from the questions that are being asked. Another method that I haven't seen very often is known as the Singapore method. I actually have no idea why it's called this, but the basic premise is that investigators wear clothing related to a certain period, so let's say Victorian, and then they will investigate using language or slang from that period in hope to create some familiarity for the spirits and encourage them to interact. This is a method that I'm yet to try, but in my opinion, experimentation should be at the forefront of investigating. And saying this, an experiment that I have personally tried was to take the 22 Mage Arcana from a deck of tarot cards, shuffling them and taking one card from the 22 Arcana, placing it in a sealed envelope with only me knowing what the card is, and throughout the evening when calling out I could periodically ask the spirits to communicate the card to the group, either via one of the devices or telepathically to one of us. Interestingly, I tried this once at a place called Merley House, and the name of the card actually came through our Alice box, which is a random word generator, and you can watch the video of this via this link above. Another thought I had recently was more so around the language that we use while calling out. It is always worth introducing yourself to the spirits in the location you are investigating. 
Hi, I'm Robert Grayson. Pleased to meet you. No, I'm Robert Grayson. But using terms like, if there's anybody here, can you please make your presence known, can potentially seem a little bit too formal or unnatural. And using a less formal way of speaking could give better results. Something like, hi, I'm Mike, how are you feeling, is worth testing in my opinion. Something else I found while calling out is that speaking clearly with some level of conviction or sternness seems to get results. And while this may seem like antagonizing or provocation to some people, it never gets that extreme. For instance, saying something like, if you'd like to speak to us, can you knock on a wall, please? Ooh, you're hard, showing off. With some conviction in your voice can go a long way. This is by all means not an exhaustive list of investigation techniques and you should always choose methods that you enjoy and are comfortable with, but please promise me that you will try and think outside the box and come up with your own experimentation and investigation techniques when you're out in the field. Anyway, that's this video done. Let me know what investigation methods you're trying in the comments below. Watch this video next on what equipment to take on your next ghost hunt.